everyone, and welcome to our Winter Solstice live stream. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the course instructors for our classes on Udemy and Coursera. We are excited to have you here. We know a lot of you find us through other means, and we are happy to have all of you with us today. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Professor Impey, and uh, he can welcome you, and then we'll get started with your questions. Uh, post those in the chat and I will grab the questions from there. Please post them only once. Um, we try to skip around and get a variety of topics and keep it an introductory level. Uh, there you go, off to you, Chris. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, welcome everyone for our last live stream of 2021. It's, it's been a year, just like the year before, actually. Um, and uh, so welcome to everyone who may be in the online, one of our online courses, or who's just found this by other means. I'm happy to take your questions on astronomy. All right, well, we will get started from a question from an email. Uh, Wendy Traver sent uh, a question, uh, which is, if the speed of light were slightly different, how would that affect our universe, if at all? If the speed of light were different, um, we probably wouldn't notice much difference in cosmology or in physics even uh, if it were somewhat different, you know, 5%, few percent, 10% different. Um, we'd still have vast light travel times looking across the observable universe. Um, they would just change proportionally to the speed of light changing. But if the speed of light were different by order of magnitude or more, we'd start to see dramatic differences in how we viewed the universe and in terms of even terrestrial physics. I mean, the speed of light is an absolute constant. It's a foundation stone of special relativity that the speed of light is an absolute number and an absolute constant. Its particular value is not wired into physics in any profound or fundamental way. That's what people might hope to discover in a future unified theory of all fields of physics. So at the moment, we just accept it as a, as a piece of the landscape of physics. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants, Rana Osama asks, um, what are the most recent space discoveries? So can you talk about some of the most exciting recent discoveries in astronomy and astrobiology from your perspective, of course? Sure. Um, well, in, uh, in cosmology, there's, uh, there's some tension over the nature of the Hubble expansion in the near universe and the far universe. So this is, this is more of a controversy or a problem rather than a discovery. Uh, it's, but the issue of whether you measure the same expansion rate in the near universe and the far universe, and they're consistent with a single expansion model, it's fundamental to cosmology. So it's been a lot of work on that in the last year. Uh, and it's not really a resolved issue. In terms of a discovery, something from just the last few months, a couple of different groups have started to discover uh, galaxies with no dark matter in them. And since you know, for most of the last 20, 30, 40 years, we've found that galaxies are dominated by dark matter, including the Milky Way, typically five or six times as much as the normal stuff. Finding galaxies without dark matter is, is very interesting. It doesn't uh, mitigate dark matter. It doesn't mean we don't need dark matter. But it makes us wonder more about what dark matter is. So each of these little galaxies, they tend to be dwarf galaxies with no dark matter, uh, are little test cases of our understanding of astrophysics. Um, and, and so you have to invent quite interesting scenarios by which a galaxy could consist only of stars without the dark matter. So that's an interesting discovery. Um, in astrobiology, of course, there's, there are many new planet discoveries all the time. There are many more Earth-like planets. Uh, including some that are, you know, strikingly close to Earth in all their properties. So I'd say the discovery of a s small set of what we would only call Earth clones is a major discovery of astrobiology. Um, and also out in the planetary world, the Perseverance rover has successfully cached its first sample of Mars, having trouble with its drill, tr dealing with a very tough rock on Mars, it started to cache its rock samples for eventual sample return. So that would be an amazing discovery. And obviously the big event of 2021 is the one that's going to occur uh, just before Christmas, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the next question is from Jayant Bakar who asks, um, can you explain uh, why the speed of light is constant for all observers and how that works? 
Um, the speed of light is a constant, and that's an observational statement. Um, Einstein turned it into a predicate of his theory of relativity. But the constancy of the speed of light uh, was derived by the Michelson-Morley experiment early in the 20th century, around 1903. Um, the question was, what does light propagate through? Does it propagate through some invisible medium in space? And in the 19th century, that was called the ether. Uh, or is this vacuum of space literally a true vacuum? And the Michelson-Morley experiment was an attempt to de detect the medium through which light propagates and with respect which it would have the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. That experiment failed to detect a, a medium through which light traveled and along the way showed that light arrives at the same speed with the same speed regardless of the Earth's motion around the sun. And that was a very profound result, it not only showing there's no ether, as people had speculated, but also that the constancy of the speed of light does not depend on the motion of the observer. Einstein turned that into a premise of his special theory of relativity. And if you accept the constancy of the speed of light, since speed is a distance divided by a time, then space and time must be supple in terms of motions close to the speed of light. And these are the consequences of special relativity. Uh, the next question is from Stan Stachowiak, who sent an email. Uh, I read a story <clears throat> uh, about a recently published astrophysics journal article concerning new research on the early and late Hubble constant. The story mentioned the Hubble tension and distance ladders. I think I understand them, but would appreciate your explanation of these terms. Sure. The, the tension that's being alluded to is this uh, an inconsistency between the expansion rate of the nearby universe, which we measure through measurements of nearby galaxies and their properties, and the inferred expansion rate at a much earlier time based on an expanding universe model and our measurement of how much dark energy and dark matter there is in the universe. Um, and, and they tend to disagree by a modest amount, but it's outside the experimental errors. To set up the local expansion rate, we use the distance ladder, as alluded to. And that's a series of distance estimators that start nearby in the Milky Way galaxy, and then they move outward to more distant galaxies. The base of the pyramid of distance measurement is direct trigonometry, parallax. And that's how we can measure distances to stars uh, over a significant fraction of the Milky Way. But that doesn't get us to external galaxies. To external galaxies, you have to use the properties of particular stars, typically Cepheid variables, uh, whose luminosity is very tightly correlated with the period of their oscillation or, or brightness variation. And then you can calibrate that in the galaxy and then pr use it for Cepheid variables in external galaxies. This is what Hubble did to measure the distance to Andromeda in, in the 1920s. So this measurement, and then also the use of supernovae, allows us to measure the distance to galaxies in the relatively nearby universe. So that's the local Hubble constant, the current expansion rate, because it's the recent past. And the early or distant uh, Hubble constant is the expansion rate as inferred by measurements of the microwave background very early in the history of the universe. And you can connect the early and the recent expansion rates to a cosmological model. And that model depends on dark energy and dark matter, which we think we've measured the amount of if we don't fundamentally understand them. And these, do, these dots do not join up. You cannot connect these two measurements directly. They don't overlap when you use the cosmological model. And that's the Hubble tension. It's not clear whether it's going to go away or not. There are systematic errors involved in distance measurements of any kind. And so most astronomers suspect that in the end, when the errors are properly understood, this tension will dissolve. But it's not clear that that's the case yet. The next question is from Lawrence K, who's on with us live. Do quantum interactions violate the second law of thermodynamics in that such events can go from low entropy to high entropy and vice versa? Can't quantum events go forward or backward in time? Uh, it's true that uh, quantum interactions or fundamental interactions of particles are generally time reversible. And the time reversibility does imply uh, that they are not uh, creating entropy or they're violating some thermodynamic principle. But remember, this only applies to single or double or multiple particle interactions. Uh, the appearance of entropy in the arrow of time and the law of thermodynamics essentially 
only applies, classical thermodynamics applies to ensembles of particles. So when you're down at the level of individual particle interactions, quantum theory dominates, and that's a theory that does say that things are time reversible. Uh, when you're dealing with ensembles of particles, then the aggregate properties are subject to the laws of thermodynamics. So somewhere there's a transition between the microscopic single particle realm and the macroscopic large collection of particle realm that takes us from quantum theory to classical thermodynamics. Um, so David Gold has a question about Ilya Prigogine's theory related to self-organizing systems. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, can you talk a little bit about how that has or has it contributed to the field of astronomy? So there are various um, ideas out there of uh, hierarchical structures in nature that can happen in various ways. Um, we can see sort of scale-free behavior in turbulence in physics. We can see it in the hierarchies of structures in the, in the world of biology, uh, in the you know, sort of the world of the biological structures that we see around us. And in astronomy, we even see it in the structure of the universe from small scales to large scales. Uh, the self-organizing principle is an interesting idea um, because it, it implies that the organization it has its own logic, it follows its own rules, and is internally consistent. So that is probably not controversial. What becomes controversial in, in the way this theory is used sometimes is to imply what we would in philosophy say is teleology, that is there's some purposefulness to the behavior. And so when you move into the realm of talking about self-organizing systems indicating some purpose, purpose to their organization, some direction or endpoint that's not just dictated by laws of physics, then it becomes slightly controversial. So this self-organization principle has a very sort of simple form that's uncontroversial and has a more advanced form that is actually quite controversial because it implies uh, purpose built into nature. Uh, the next question is a pretty general question. We have It seems like we have several young people or people who are uh, either in high school or um, who are in college and finishing college, and they'd like for you to talk a little bit about how to get into the field of astronomy. So. You know, from high from a high school level, how does one get into astronomy? And then for folks who are in college and maybe finishing up like biotechnology or you know a degree, how does one get into the field of astronomy in graduate school? So for the transition from, I'll treat it as two separate questions because it's really a different path or a different part of a career path. For the transition from high school into college, you would be lucky if you happen to be at one of the maybe only 10% of the, the United States high schools that have astronomy courses taught. And, and, and worldwide, the fraction, I doubt, is higher than that, may even be lower. So it's very unlikely or unusual to actually get a, a true astronomy course in high school. You might be able to take one online, and many people do that, actually. And many of the participants in our MOOCs, our massive open online classes that I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, are indeed high school students. So that's one way to take astronomy before you get to college. And that can ease the transition into an astronomy program. If you're really interested in astronomy and know it, then you're going to be looking for an astronomy bachelor's degree. And in the United States, there are, there are probably 30 or 35 programs that offer the BSc in astronomy. Many of them are, of course, double majoring. People who do this double major with physics. So these are located often in physics and astronomy departments. And there's some advantage to getting a double major because much of the coursework is in common. You'll be taking a lot of math and physics if you've done astronomy bachelors, uh, just as you will, obviously, doing a physics bachelors. So that would be the path, to try and find one of the programs that does have astronomy as a specialty. Otherwise, in a general physics bachelors program, you'd be likely to get one lower division astronomy course and maybe one or two electives on offer upper division. So you wouldn't really get a large dose of astronomy. For applying to graduate school or making the transition from undergraduate to graduate school, it's a different set of calculations. If you are in a basically a physics program or a math program or, as the question asked, uh, more in a technology program or engineering, uh, then that move to astronomy at the graduate level is quite challenging. 
because graduate students in astronomy are uh, anticipated or expected to have a fairly good backing uh, background in physics. And so if you haven't had a lot of undergraduate physics at, at a more advanced level, so upper division classes, then it's going to be very hard to get into a graduate program. For instance, you have to take the physics GRE and do reasonably well at that. Um, so you may need to transition into uh, a PhD program or a graduate program in astronomy by making up or some deficiency in math and physics if your field was very far from physics and astronomy as an undergrad. But it is possible. Some people do that. And once you're in a university, transitioning between programs is often easy. If both, if the programs you're interested in are offered, then you can transfer in between programs within a university probably much easier than you can between universities. Um, and then as kind of a follow-up, can you talk a little bit about the difference between astrophysics, astronomy, and cosmology as fields of study? Sure. The difference between, there isn't really a tangible difference between astronomy and astrophysics. Um, there, there are different terms essentially for the same thing. To, to some people, to some academics, the word astronomy is more general and it means the study of astronomical objects, obviously, um, of any kind. So it's a very broad term. It encompasses the entirety of the subject. Astrophysics is slightly more specific and the hybrid word, of course, incorporates physics. So that implies more the application of physics to the universe. Well, astronomers are doing that too. So to me, those distinctions are a little bit semantic or moot. However, students sometimes care about that distinction. Around the country in the last few years, there, there have been a set of departments that have rebranded their graduate programs from being PhDs in astronomy to being PhDs in astronomy and astrophysics or PhDs in astrophysics because of the perception amongst graduate students and many faculty that astrophysics is a more righteous word to use for the subject and implies more physics background but doesn't neglect astronomy too because it's a hybrid word. So that's what goes on in academia, but really the difference is not huge. Cosmology is a different word entirely because it's dealing with a subset of the study of astronomy or astrophysics. It deals with the study of the universe as, an in, as a single entity. So cosmology is not so much the study of objects in the universe, um, such as galaxies or stars or planets, but it's the study of the universe as a whole its behavior, its history, its age, its contents, and its fate. Uh, the next question is from an, e from an email. Can you explain the Eddington mass limit on stars? Right. So uh, Arthur Eddington, to give the background when things are named after people, it's useful to know who they are. Arthur Eddington was by much, by many consensus views, one of the premier astrophysicists of the 20th century, the early 20th century. He's an English astronomer. Uh, he was uh, knighted later in his life. And he developed the theory of stellar structure and, and a lot of very fundamental principles of how stars work. And one of the uh, principles he came up with was the situation of accretion when a star is uh, subject to gravitational infall and is radiation pressure is pushing outward. And so there's a maximum rate of infall before the infall rate is balanced by radiation pressure pushing outward. And that is the Eddington limit. In other words, you cannot accrete mass onto a star by gravity faster than a certain rate because of the radiation pressure pushing outward. That's the Eddington limit, and it has wide use in astrophysics. Uh, the next question is from one of our live participants. Aman Gala asks, is it possible for a human brain to think about dimensions beyond the third dimension? If so, then how can we interpret it in space? Well, I think it's a challenge for the human brain to think in more than three dimensions because the world we occupy, the world we live in and are born in and will die in, has three dimensions of space. It's certainly not beyond the human brain to think of that. Uh, there are definitely people with very high level abstract skills or mathematical skills who are quite happily able to think in more than three dimensions or conceptualize more than three dimensions. For example, the mathematics of multidimensional space uh, is, is easy for a mathematician. It's easy to lay out. And that is talking about 
hidden dimensions or dimensions you can't see. And if you are the kind of person who can intuit mathematics once you've seen it written out, then you're probably conceptualizing multidimensional space. As for whether such multi-dimensions beyond the three we see are real physical entities in our universe, that remains an open question. Uh, certain theory, theories like string theory posit that there are hidden dimensions only accessible at extraordinary energies required to unify all the forces of nature. Um, we've seen hints, perhaps, of these extra dimensions, but no direct evidence of them so far. Excellent. Well, there's a big event in the astronomy world coming up. The launch of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope is happening in just a few days. So we have several questions about that. So we'll go through a few as sort of a theme. Um, Sarav asks, uh, will the James Webb Telescope help us learn more about dark matter and dark energy? And if so, how will that happen? The James Webb Space Telescope will contribute to cosmology in many ways. It's not designed directly to address the issue of dark matter and dark energy. Uh, for example, I would, as a counterpoint, I'd say that the Vera Rubin Observatory down in the Southern Hemisphere in Chile, for which we made the telescope mirror, um, it was previously called the Large Scale Synoptic Telescope. That telescope is, was directly a designed to address dark energy and dark matter with large scale galaxy surveys. James Webb Space Telescope has a very small field of view. It can't look at a lot of objects at once. And it's actually not, therefore, best served for surveying things like dark matter and dark energy. It's clearly going to impact cosmology, however, just because of its enormous sensitivity in the infrared and its depth of view as a six and a half meter telescope. So what it's primarily going to do is tell the early story of the universe from the dark ages after the universe cooled uh, when matter first became neutral neutral hydrogen atoms, uh, to the gravitational formation of the first structures, stars and galaxies, after some amount of time. And we don't know what it is. That's what James Webb hopes to measure. Excellent. So I think we've now answered uh, uh, Raul Gonzalez's questions, um, which is, throughout its life, what types of data will the James Webb t Telescope uh, look for? Um, so. Uh, I think uh, the next one for, from Prabir, uh, who would like to know, um, the James Webb Telescope will be positioned at L2 after launching on the 24th of December. Um, how long will it take to come to the right location? And will it orbit the Earth at a constant rate? Can you talk a little bit about how it's going to get to its final location and how that works once it's there? Yeah, it's a, it's a million miles from the Earth, so it's a, it's a long way to go. The, the L2 is an unstable Lagrange point. It's a gravity balance point in the Earth-Sun-Moon system. The reason it needs to be sent that far, and NASA has sent other satellites there before, so this is proven technology to get a mission or a satellite or a telescope to L2 or one of these Lagrange points. Um, the reason it wants to be there is because it's an extremely stable and quiet environment for astronomy. Um, James Webb is an infrared telescope, a near-infrared telescope primarily. You need incredibly dark backgrounds uh, for that to work. The Earth environment is, is too noisy. The Earth is too warm, basically. So uh, it's not a good environment for infrared astronomy. Um, and James Webb is going to the best place to do near-infrared work. It's going to take about a month to get there and to do all of its checks to make sure it's stable. Uh, it has small retro rockets, it has small rockets that can keep it uh, in position because it's an unstable gravity balance point, which means it's an unstable equilibrium, which means if you did nothing, the telescope would gradually drift away from its position and move off into deep space. So it's going to need continual adjustments. And the primary mission of the James Webb is five years, and pretty much everyone's hoping that it gets ten years doing its work. So keeping it stable at that position should not be an issue. Um, it'll take a full six months to go through the test phase of the James Webb before it starts taking routine science data because it has complicated instruments. Each of their modes has to be checked. The temperature of the detectors and the telescope itself have to be stabilized at a very low level to, for it to be as sensitive as it needs to be. And obviously NASA's got to perfect the data flow to and from the telescope, both the commands to instruct the telescope how to observe 
and then the astronomical data it sends back to the Earth. Uh, the next question is from Saliha Amar, who asks, uh, I have heard that some robots are created to observe the Mars environment. Uh, so can you maybe just talk a little bit about some of the robotic missions that have gone to Mars and, um, and what we've learned from those? I mean, in general terms, you'd say that all of the rovers um, that have been sent to Mars uh, ha are essentially robots. They're little robots. They're, they're autonomous, semi-autonomous vehicles uh, taking their orders from the Earth. Um, you can't really have a fully autonomous rover on Mars because the environment is hazardous enough that it, there is no AI system yet designed that would ensure the integrity and longevity of an, a fully autonomous robot. So these robots do make their own decisions in real time to avoid hazards and to send back data and even to do some science experiments, but their overall arc is controlled by humans. And the first of these, of course, is uh, quite a long time ago. 1995 was the Sojourner rover, which is a, a very small rover, not much bigger than a shoebox. So that was the first robot we had on Mars. Obviously, the ones that were most famous for many people were Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, one of those lasted more than 10 years, which was extraordinary given they were only s supposed to last three months or designed to last three months. And, and then, of course, we've had the two rovers with very similar design, of which uh, Curiosity was the first and Perseverance, the current one, is doing its work on Mars. So there will be more rovers to come. Um, they are robots. They're getting more capable. The AI that runs them is getting more capable, so they need less and less human intervention. And I think, for example, that perseverance goes for days at a time, uh, really without any human intervention. All right, thank you. The next question is from Drishti Chawan, who asks, can you briefly explain the singularity and event horizon of a black hole? Yes, a black hole is a very simple object in physics terms. Um, in principle, it only has uh, structurally two features. One is the event horizon, and that is the boundary that demarcates the universe we can see from the universe, a part of the universe that we cannot see, because inside the event horizon, uh, information is trapped. Light, matter, radiation, anything is trapped, and that means that's why it looks like a black hole, and that's why it's called a black hole, uh, and that's the event horizon. Uh, it's an information barrier or membrane. It's not really a physical barrier at all. Um, so that's one part of a black hole's properties. And then by the theory of black holes, the intense gravity at the center of a black hole creates a cusp in mass, which means the mass density in principle becomes infinite at the center of a black hole, and that's called a singularity. And that's a problem because any infinite quantity in physics is unphysical. It does not mean physics is doing a good job explaining it. And so the fact that the theory, the basic theory of black holes predicts singularities is a problem. It means the theory is incomplete. And we've known black hole theory is incomplete since Hawking did his work 40 or 45 years ago. So with those two simple properties, there's still more to learn because the singularity is unphysical. We can't inspect or interrogate inside of a black hole, so it's going to be very interesting to figure out ways to diagnose what the black hole is like inside the event horizon. The next question is from Natalia Pastori. If it is possible, or is it possible, that there is life based on hydrocarbons, such as methane, and not on water? This is the speculation that would attach to the idea of life on Titan. Uh, Titan is the large, a large moon of Saturn, um, which has an atmosphere as thick as the Earth and made of essentially the same thing, nitrogen. In the, in the case of Titan, it's almost pure nitrogen. Earth has one-fifth oxygen as well. So it's a, this is a massive moon with a thick atmosphere. It's very far from the sun, so it's cold. And the bodies of liquid on the surface of Titan are bodies of ethane, methane, so liquid ethane, methane, seas or oceans, mixed with a little bit of ammonia and some water. Um, the idea of biology in that environment is up for grabs. It's a matter of speculation. Lab astronomy has tried to replicate the environment of Titan. That's actually hard to do in a lab. And tried to see whether these hydrocarbons in various compositions, uh, in various mixtures, 
can somehow lead to more complex molecules. And some of that does happen. Also, you can simulate the, a Titan environment or a hydrocarbon-rich uh, environment in a computer and see what happens, and also vary the mixture of ingredients. And again, it shows that some complex molecules form. Uh, as soon as you have hydrocarbons, of course, you have the ability to create long carbon chains, because that's what carbon is good at. So these things do form naturally in these environments, we think. Uh, but we haven't got direct measurement of that, because we've only ever been for about, with data, half an hour to the surface of Titan with the Huygens probe. It was uh, almost two decades ago. Uh, the next question is from Hernan Reyes, who uh, would like to know the Cassini-Huygens used the slingshot method to propel it to Saturn. Once there, Titan's gravity was used similarly to adjust its trajectory. Uh, for a mission like the upcoming Europa Clipper, can Ganymede do the same thing? Um, if the orbital dynamics allow it, yes, you can certainly use uh, Ganymede as a gravitational slingshot. So the challenge of outer solar system missions is, first of all, to get there in a reasonable time frame, uh, again, going against the force of the sun's gravity. And so typically what outer solar system missions do is they come, they go inwards to, to, to Venus, typically as massive as the Earth, uh, almost equal to the Earth in mass, and use that for, to give a gravitational assist. And that projects the spacecraft has to come all the way back out past the Earth, so it, it does take a little extra time, but it's gained enough speed that it makes it worthwhile, because the cost otherwise would be rocket fuel. And so you use gravitational assist in the inner solar system to get you to the outer solar system. And then, of course, when you've got there at a reasonable speed, enough that it only takes five or six years, you have the reverse problem. You have to somehow slow down enough to go into orbit around the target of interest, say Europa. And so that is an extreme challenge of gravitational dynamics, because you have to work out where the various objects you might want to use are, like Ganymede, as a, as a possibility, uh, the most massive of the moons in the whole solar system, um, and, and make sure you can do the orbital calculations that would let you use Ganymede to slow you down and then project you into a captured orbit of Europa. And then you have to circularize the orbit, too, because your initial orbit will be quite elongated. So it's all very challenging. I've seen models or calculations where it's been done in principle. So the, the possibility of doing it is, is certainly there. And people have been doing gravitational slingshots in solar system missions for decades. Uh, so the people with the expertise to do this have been thinking about it pretty hard. And I think it can be done. Uh, our next question is from one of our live participants, Jayant Bakar asks, can you explain a little bit about the experiment that led to the conclusion that light speed is constant and observer independence? You mentioned this, Michael Morley. Can you talk a little bit about how that worked? Right. So um, the Michael Morley experiment was, uh, I think 1903 was the year. Um, and it was, it basically used a an interferometer, so it, it used a situation of a very stable base. Um, I think it was a granite slab in this case. And they set up an optical experiment uh, where light went through a beam splitter and it went in two or orthogonal directions. Then it traveled some distance in the lab. It was physically quite a big experiment, but it, it fit inside a lab. And then, having been bounced backwards and forwards in two orthogonal directions, the light was recombined uh, into an interferogram, so looking for interference. And that method, an interf interferometer, is used to look for any tiny difference in either the path length of the two orthogonal arms of the experiment or the arrival time of the photons in the two different arms. And so in principle, if the Earth is moving around the Sun, then between the orthogonal arms in one of the arms of the experiment, the light is either traveling with or against the Earth's motion around the sun. And in the other arm, at 90 degrees, it's traveling transverse to the Earth's motion around the sun, which should make no difference. And so what people were looking for was the effect of the Earth's motion around the sun, uh, changing the, pat the arrival time of the photons in that arm of the experiment. And in principle, it was detectable, because the Earth's motion around the sun uh, is a small fraction of the speed of light, but it's not so small a fraction that an interferometer can't detect it. 
and the result was a no result. Nothing was seen. No change in path length or arrival time of photons was seen between the two arms of the experiment. In other words, the experiment seemed oblivious to the fact that the Earth was moving around the Sun. Light didn't care. Light arrived at 300,000 kilometers per second or traveled at 300,000 kilometers per second in each arm of the experiment and over a whole year as the Earth moved around the Sun, the result didn't change. And so that essentially said there was no medium through which light was propagating out in space and that the speed of light was constant as far as experimenters could tell. Uh, and so a uh, kind of follow-up question to that is, uh, out of curiosity, how is it that something like light can even have properties? Like, it, I guess they they don't understand quite how light is a thing. It's not a physical object. Right. Well, the, the work there, of course, is the classic physics of James Clerk Maxwell from the, I think it's the 1860s and 1870s. He wrote his papers and did his work. He's a... Uh, James Clark Maxwell is a compatriot of mine, a, a Scot. Um, the last time I was in Edinburgh was just a couple of years ago. I went to James Clark Maxwell House, which is in a very nice part of Edinburgh. He was fairly affluent later in his life. And his house has been beautifully preserved with uh, instruments and papers and writings and his study and so on. It's a, it's a nice place to visit. Most people don't think of it when they go to Edinburgh. Um, so Maxwell was the one who insightfully understood that light was what we now think of as an electromagnetic wave. So he conceptualized light and all other forms of radiation, like radio waves, gamma rays, x-rays, infrared, and ultraviolet, as coupled electric and magnetic oscillations, where the oscillations are orthogonal between the electric and the magnetic fields, and the oscillations propagate through a vacuum at a particular speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, the precursor to Maxwell's work, he didn't work in a vacuum, so to speak, uh, were the beautiful, very elegant experiments of Michael Faraday, uh, probably more like the turn of the century or the 18th century. Faraday worked on uh, static and changing electric and magnetic fields and gave the first indication that pushed Maxwell along the road to his theory. And he describes the electromagnetic waves with four classic equations of physics that are the Maxwell's equations. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about electric and magnetic coupled oscillations traveling through space at a particular speed. Uh, the next question is from uh, one of our live participants, Drishti Chawan asks, uh, what is the Hubble constant? The Hubble constant is the local expansion rate of the universe. Um, the word constant is a little misleading because the expansion rate of the universe has changed over time. Um, it slowed down for a long period as the universe decelerated due to the influence of dark matter and normal matter. And in the last few billion years, the expansion rate has been increasing or accelerating um, at, due to the effects of dark energy. So in terms of a Hubble parameter, which is a more general way to describe it, uh, the expansion rate was slowing down for a long time and then has been increasing. But the Hubble constant is the term used for the local expansion rate. That's measured in the nearby universe at distances small enough that the light travel time is a small fraction of the age of the universe. In other words, you're looking at the present day universe. And typically and classically with the Hubble Space Telescope in it, one of its three key projects soon after it was launched was to measure the Hubble constant with a precision of at least 10%. And it was one of the great successes of the Hubble Space Telescope to do that within the first few years of its launch. Um, and numerically, this is about 67. It's in the upper 60s. It has an error attached, but it's in the upper 60s kilometers per second per megaparsec. And what that means is for every megaparsec you go out from the Milky Way, megaparsec is three and a third million light years, an object is moving. Uh, 67 or 68 kilometers per second away from you, redshift. So if you go 2 megaparsecs, it's 2 times 68. 10 times uh, 10 megaparsecs, it's 10 times 68. So it's a linear expansion rate. That's the Hubble flow, and the number itself is called the Hubble constant. Uh, the next question is from Raul Gonzalez, who asks, uh, why is the James Webb telescope being launched from Guyana? Does it have to do with some technical situation, or is it simply administrative? 
Um, it has to do with uh, energy. It has to do with the Earth's rotation. Uh, these, uh, the Ariane 5 rocket and payload, the James Webb is a very massive telescope. So launching heavy payloads is difficult. It costs a lot in terms of rocket fuel. And so um, you're actually using the Earth's spin to, to reduce the energy requirement to get into Earth orbit. If you launch from the pole, you have no assist from the Earth's spin. So you want to be as near the equator as possible to get that extra boost. Uh, that's, for example, why the United States launches from Kennedy Space Center in the southern, almost at the southern tip of Florida, which is about the southernmost place you can get in the United States. But internationally, and for the Europeans who are in an even worse situation at a northern latitude, they use Guiana because it's very near the equator, uh, and so it gives you an extra assist for launching anything into orbit. Um, the next question is again from Hernan who asks, in the outer solar system, sunlight is too weak for solar panels. Are plutonium generators the only practical replacements that can provide similar energy for probes to function for many years? Uh, yes, in the outer solar system where solar power diminishing as a s inverse square of the distance from the sun just becomes feeble, uh, radioactivity is truly the only power source. And the radioactivity power source for NASA has had a vexed history. Um, uh, the NASA had these very efficient uh, radioactive powered power units called RTGs that it used in its classic missions in the 1970s and 1980s. Sometime around the 1980s and into the 1990s, uh, Congress got all upset and animated about radioactivity in space. Uh, these, of course, were heading far out in the solar system. The concern was that if the object broke up at launch or in the Earth's atmosphere, then you'd have radioactive waste falling out to the Earth. It's not really a very large amount, but it's significant. Uh, and so a deep concern over radioactivity and NASA launching it and perhaps mis mishaps along the way will essentially led NASA to, to be told not to use radioactive energy sources. And that situation actually only changed a few years ago. So NASA now is able to use radioactive sources to power its missions far from the sun. And that is the real only way to do it. And of course, these are quite, they're quite low power sources. They're not enormously powerful, um, but they are very long lived. So they can make a mission last a long time. Uh, the next question is from one of our live viewers. Uh, who would like to know, uh, Wendy would like to know, why will there be a merger in the local group, Andromeda and the Magellanic Cloud, that goes against dark energy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so generally, galaxies are moving away from each other, uh, expanding universe, and they're moving away from each other at faster and faster rates due to dark energy. So on large scales, by which I mean millions of light years, um, that's true. And if that were the case, Overall, if galaxies were uniformly or smoothly distributed through space, they would just flee from each other and you'd never have mergers or interactions. But galaxies are not uniformly distributed. Galaxies have been always clustered together. Galaxies aggregate by gravity. So essentially, the galaxies clustering over cosmic time has competed with dark energy and has led to some galaxies being gathered in a region of space where their mutual gravity holds them in that position. And so we are in such a situation. The local group is a situation where the mutual gravity of the local group, which is two large galaxies, us and Andromeda and a few dozen dwarf galaxies, is sufficient to hold them together. This we call it as a bound system. And it's a bound system enough that the Milky Way and Andromeda are approaching each other at 100 kilometers per second. And so that's why projecting that forward in three or four billion years, we predict a cl close interaction, not a direct head-on collision, but a close interaction followed by a uh, spiraling in and merger of the nuclei of these galaxies and a heavy disruption of their stellar orbits further out. Um, so it's really because the the local group is a marginally gravitationally bound system that there will be that collision and merger. Uh, the next question is from Oliver Johnston who asks, can you comment on theories in science fiction about space folding, warp speeds, and other means to travel at or faster than the speed of light? Is this fiction or theoretically possible one day? 
it's it is fiction and some of it is theoretically possible um, the idea of using the structure of space-time itself as a propulsion mechanism is a science fictional idea of course but it has a basis in physics and so you can work in general relativity and you can do calculations of space-times that are much more complicated and maybe more interesting than ours remember space-time in the universe we live in is actually really boring for the most part it's, it's essentially flat although space-time is curved by mass and energy uh, on average the density of mass and energy is not enough to curve it significantly at all so these folded space-time geometries which you can potentially harness you can harness some gravitational potential energy if you make the right geometry of space-time and create an idea of a comp propulsion system it's hypothetically possible but the truth is these are highly contrived space-time situations uh, and therefore they're physically extremely implausible so I think they veer more into the truly hypothetical than the plausible. Um, the next question is from Debarshi Roy, who asks, um, in, this is actually in response to an earlier question where you mentioned that the universe is 93 billion light years wide. Um, how is the universe 93 billion light years wide when it's just 13.7 billion years old? Does the universe expand faster than light, or did it at some point in the past? Um, yes, that's right. So you've, you've speculated the answer in, in the question itself. Um, indeed, it would seem that if the universe is 13.7, 13.8 billion years old, uh, the distance to the edge of visible space in any direction should only be 13.8 billion light years. Uh, and if that were all that were going on, if it were just light traveling through static space-time, that would be the case. But the universe was expanding faster than light for the first third of its existence for three or four billion years, by which I mean any two points in space-time were moving away from each other faster than light speed for billions of years in the first part of the universe's history. And so that means that the regions that are now within our horizon, that is regions which we can see light reaching us eventually have because they went faster than light originally but then slowed down to be less than light speed allowing us to see them but because of that faster than light expansion for some period of time and the physical stretching implied by that you end up with a distance in any direction of about 46 billion light years and so the diameter is twice that 92 billion Uh, the next question is from an email. Uh, Pritha Jaipal asks, although time dilation is a very popular concept, um, it is still quite hard to wrap my head around it. Could you give us a, an explanation so that we might be able to understand it better? Well, time dilation is um, the slowing down of a clock. So if you just imagine a, a, you know, an ideal clock, um, that's probably not a physical clock because we don't make very good clocks with human technology. That's probably going to be a clock like a radioactive decaying source which has a very particular way to decay that we think is impervious to physical conditions. Or it might be an oscillation, a fundamental uh, oscillation of an atom or a molecule. These can be used as clocks. So time dilation occurs when the entity that whose time keeping you can measure um, is moving at a substantial fraction of the speed of light relative to another observer. And in that frame of reference, uh, we see their clock slowing down. Now the, now the entity itself, their clock seems to behave normally. So this is a relative uh, thing that you observe with fast-moving objects. Um, so fast-moving objects have clocks that run slower. The same is true of clocks in gravitational fields clocks in gravitational fields run slower than clocks without gravitational fields present. Uh, that's part of general relativity. And the proof of this, not the only, but the first convincing proof of this came from observing cosmic rays, actually. So cosmic rays are uh, charged and sometimes radioactive isotopes or particles that come through the atmosphere uh, from distant sources in the universe. Um, and when they involve particles that have a particular decay time, um, then you can use that decay time as a clock. And in the 1950s, actually, it was observed that certain species of cosmic rays reached the Earth's surface 
when based on their decay time, they shouldn't because they should have decayed in the upper atmosphere. And so the inference was that because they were moving very fast, close to the speed of light, their clocks were running slower, their time was dilated, and that actually let these species reach the Earth, Earth's surface and detectors when they otherwise would have just decayed in the atmosphere. So that became a very interesting test of time dilation and a, and a sort of proof of special relativity. Uh, the next question is from Simongo the Magnificent. Um, do you project the universe will grow cold, distant, and low energy in the far future, or is there evidence for a regenerative process of concentration and collapse in the future? It appears if dark energy has the properties we think it does, which is that it does not change its physical nature over time or across space, that the accelerating expansion will continue, the universe will continue to dissipate, Eventually, the gravitational sources of energy in the universe, which are stars, um, you know, a hundred billion billion stars in the universe, eventually they will all die and become stellar corpses. So with no new energy sources, and with matter being more and more thinly distributed, and the microwaves left over from the Big Bang being stretched even more into very diffuse and extremely low energy radio waves, it does appear that the universe has a low energy uh, fate, and there's no countervailing uh, force or physical property that would lead new energy to be created. Um, Drishti Zamadas Live asks, uh, it is said that there is infinite mass in zero volume in the singularity of a black hole. Can you talk a little bit about that and whether that's physically possible or if that's really just a mathematical approximation? It's, it's a mathematical statement that is an approximation in the end because it's not a, f it's not a physically sensible statement. Um, clearly, a black hole does not have infinite mass. So if we just step aside from the black hole and, out and just look at what goes into forming a black hole, it's a collapsed star. For example, it might have a mass of three, five, ten times the mass of the sun. So a black hole uh, has a certain mass, and we can measure the mass of the black holes we observe in the universe, in the nearby universe. So, if a black hole has a finite mass, it doesn't really make much sense to has it, to say it has an infinite mass density anywhere, because an infinite mass density extrapolates or projects to infinite mass. So, immediately, it, you can see that it's not a sensible characterization. So, the problem is clearly that the theory is predicting something that's not physical and not physically sensible. Uh, and no one's really figured out how to finesse this because the self-gravity of black holes is so strong that the matter does intensely focus on the center of the object. And so there's no avoiding this crush of matter at the center of a black hole. So all, all uh, the calculations suggest this difficult situation, uh, but it clearly can't be an impossible situation, which means we need a new theory of how to deal with this kind of physical property. Uh, the next question is from Hernan, who asks, tidal heating keeps Europa's ocean liquid, and Celadus is much smaller. How can tidal heating on such a small core keep its ocean liquid and also generate pressure to expel liquid so far into space? Um, the heating mechanism for Enceladus is, is not fully understood yet. It's true that tidal heating um, is not as strong in Enceladus as it is in a larger moon. So, there, But there are two components of tidal heating. Well, the, the one component is if you have a moon of a substantial size, then you get a tidal heating just caused by the squeezing of that object. So the gravity on the near side of the object is stronger than the gravity on the far side of the object, and that amounts to a squeezing force. Um, a second form of slower form of tidal heating comes from an object that's in a highly elliptical orbit of a planet where the actual force of gravity itself um, increases and decreases locally. And that's a second order effect, but it's a significant form of heating. Now you don't need a very large moon to have substantial tidal heating because the, the perfect example of that is Io, the moon of Jupiter, which is also quite small, um, larger than Enceladus, but a lot smaller than Europa, um, that is highly volcanic, the most volcanic world in the solar system, and that is all tidal heating. So Tidal heating can be very efficient, actually. And of course, there is always 
heating internally from the rocky material and radioactive decay in the rocky material. So that's a component of heat as well. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so it is 1157. Um, I know we need to end right on time today. So I think one more question uh, will finish us out. Um, the last question is from an email. Um, so th I think this one does have two parts. Uh, is it possible wormholes exist in the quantum foam? So first, can you talk about what a quantum foam is and then talk about uh, the possibility of wormholes existing in that? Well, the quantum foam is a is a it's an evocative term. It's not a strict physics term um, for the extremely early phase of the universe around the time of inflation. So 10 to the minus 33 to 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang when the forces of nature were all, were all um, of equal strength, essentially. And you need a quantum theory that accommodates gravity. In that situation, you can have space-time that is, that is highly complex and curved on the scale of subatomic particles. And that essentially is what quantum foam is. It's a sort of uh, seething, uh, highly curved space-time uh, where the distinction between a particle and the space it occupies essentially loses meaning. Um, throw a wormhole into the mix and it just, I think, adds a layer of speculation. So to me it's not a sensible speculation to talk about wormholes in quantum foam because quantum foam itself is a speculation and wormholes are speculation. So you're adding a speculation on top of a speculation. And, and I don't think our theory is adequate to predict or understand the properties of the putative quantum foam well enough to understand if it contained things that we might call wormholes. Interesting to think about, fun for science fiction, but not yet physics. Okay, that was a wild one to finish with. Uh, thanks for your questions, and thanks to Matthew for facilitating, and I think we've scheduled one in the new year, we'll, uh, and we'll work ahead for that. I don't know if you remember, do we have it to tell them right now before we leave, when the one in the new year is? Yes, we do, uh, but I will have to look it up. Give me one moment here. I think with the next one is January 4th. January 4th, okay. So we'll, we'll be back again January 4th, and uh, I hope everyone has good holidays. Excellent. Thank you all for coming. Uh, have, a great, uh, have a great rest of your week, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Take care.